One of the reasons we work so hard to develop the theory of general topological spaces is that it allows us to perform constructions on existing topological spaces, such as subspaces of Euclidean space, that take us outside the realm of subspaces of Euclidean space. Today we're going to see two different ways to think about new topologies on topological spaces that are kind of induced from existing topologies, and we'll really focus in on the example of quotient spaces. We'll begin by considering the following circumstance. We'll let x be a set, and we'll take a collection of topological spaces, y alpha. If we have a family of maps called f alpha from x to y alpha, one for every alpha in A, then we can give x a topology. This is going to be the coarsest topology on x, such that all of the f alphas are continuous. This is called the initial topology. Dually, if we have maps not out of x but into x from our y alphas, let's call them g alpha, these maps, then we can have a topology that is the finest topology on x, such that all the g alphas are continuous. This we call the final topology on x, relative to the g alphas. What's the point here? Well, the point is that if you have a very fine topology on x, it's quite simple to write down continuous maps out of it. Therefore, we can ask for the coarsest possible topology on x, such that all of these things are continuous. The finest possible topology will just be the discrete topology. Dually, if you have a very coarse topology on x, it's extremely easy to write down a continuous map into x. And so what we're doing here is we're identifying the finest topology on x, such that all of these g alphas are continuous. If we wanted the coarsest topology such that all of these g alphas are continuous, then we'd simply take the chaotic topology. The observation is that initial and final topologies always exist. If we start off with a collection of maps out of my x into my various y alphas, then the initial topology is the topology generated by the subbase where we take open sets of y alpha and we take their inverse images inside x under each of these maps f alpha. The topology generated by this subbase is the coarsest possible topology such that all of these maps are continuous. Dually, and more simply, if we have a collection of maps into x from our y alphas, then we can simply declare a subset v of x to be open if and only if its inverse image under all of the g alphas is open. This gives us a topology, and that topology is exactly the final topology. So these are two ways of constructing topologies from existing topological spaces, my y alphas, by using a map, either into my space x to give me the final topology, or out of my space x to give me the initial topology. One familiar example is if I take a topological space y and I take a subset of that topology, then the subspace topology on x, that's the initial topology with respect to the inclusion map from x into y. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at, in a sense, the dual of this construction. Instead of looking at an injective map from x into an existing topological space and using that to build a topology on x, we're instead going to look at a surjective map out of an existing topological space to our x, and we're going to use that to give us a topology on our x. In order to discuss this, we should recall how equivalence relations work. If we have just a plain set y, then a relation on y is said to be an equivalence relation if and only if the following conditions hold. First, every element should be related to itself under that equivalence relation. Second, if x is related to y, then y must be related to x, and vice versa. 
third, we have to have transitivity, so that if you have x, y, and z in y, and x is related to y, and y is related to z, then x must be related to z. If we satisfy these three conditions here, then we're in equivalence relation. Once you have an equivalence relation, you can look at the set of equivalence classes, which are normally denoted with these square brackets here. These are the set of elements of y that are related to our x under this equivalence relation. We're going to look at the set of all of these, and that's what we call y mod tilde. Now we can construct a map, q, from y into y mod tilde. What does it do? It sends a point x of y to its equivalence class here. This is called the quotient map, and it's always a surjection. Furthermore, every surjection happens to be a quotient map. Here's how that works. If I happen to have some random surjection from y to z, then I can define an equivalence relation on y in the following way. I can simply say that x is similar to y if and only if their images under my map P are equal. That defines an equivalence relation on y, and now I can write down a map from the set of equivalence classes on y to z, because I can simply say that I'm going to take the equivalence class of x to the value of x under this map. That defines a well-defined map, and in fact it's a bijection Now sometimes you're not so lucky. Sometimes you don't have an equivalence relation, you just have a relation. You know a few things that you'd like to identify, but you don't yet have all of the good properties, the reflexivity, the symmetry, and the transitivity of an equivalence relation. That's okay if you have any equivalence relation whatsoever, call it R, then we can speak of the smallest equivalence relation, tilde sub R, on Y, that contains my R. That is to say, this is the smallest equivalence relation on Y, such that if two things are related by R, then they're related by this equivalence relation. This is called the equivalence relation generated by R. Now once again, with this equivalence relation in hand, we're permitted to talk about the set of equivalence classes, and in an act of laziness, we simply write y mod r for the set y mod tilde r. The main point of this construction is the universal property that it satisfies. Let's look at that property now. If you have a set y, and you have a relation on y, at this point I'm not assuming that this is an equivalence relation, any relation will do for what I'm about to say, then if you take a map f from y to z, such that any two elements of y that are related under the relation r are sent to the same place, then there's a unique map, which I'll call f bar, from the set of equivalence classes of elements of y to z, such that when you compose this map with the quotient map from y to y mod r, you get back the original map f. That is to say, if you start off with the map f from y to z, and you look at the quotient map from y to y mod r, then this f factors through this quotient map in a unique fashion. And what's the rule? How do we define this f bar? Well, we say that its value on an equivalence class should be equal to the value of f on any representative of that equivalence class. So a map from the set of equivalence classes to z is the same thing as a map from y to z, which has this property, the property that says that two elements that are related under r go to the same place under f. Now we're ready to talk about quotient spaces. If we have a topological space y, and we have a relation on y, and once again I'm not going to assume that it's an equivalence relation, then the quotient topology on the set of equivalence classes is the final topology with respect to the quotient map. Now when you take the set of equivalence classes y mod r and you endow it with the quotient topology, you get what is called the quotient space y mod r and a subset of that quotient space is open 
if and only if its inverse image under the quotient map is open. Right away, let's see this in action in an example. So I'll look at the closed interval from 0 to 1. That's a perfectly good topological space. And now I'm going to look at the relation that relates 0 and 1 and doesn't do anything else. So 0 is related to 1, and nothing else is happening. Well, in that circumstance, what's happening is we're taking this topological space, but we're identifying these endpoints. And we see that the quotient y mod r is s1. The universal property of the quotient works just as well for topological spaces and continuous maps as it does for sets and ordinary maps. So if y is a topological space and r is a relation on y, then for every continuous map from y to z, with the property that it carries two points that are related to the same place, there is a unique continuous map which I shall call f bar from the quotient space to z. This is now continuous such that this same equation that we saw for sets holds here. Namely that if you compose this map with the quotient map from y to here, then you get your original map f. So once again, if I have a topological space y and I have a relation on it, then I can form this quotient map. This is now a continuous map, and indeed this has the finest topology such that this map is continuous. And now if I have any other continuous map from y to z that carries any two points that are related under my relation r to the same place, then that map will factor in a unique fashion through the quotient. And that map will now be continuous. Suppose that I have a topological space x, and suppose that I have some non-empty subset s of my x. I'm going to introduce a relation. That relation is going to say that if I have two points of s, then they're related. And otherwise, it does nothing. Now when I look at the set of equivalence classes for that relation, I call that x mod s. This is a bit of an abusive notation, but it's very common. So what's happening here? Well, what's happening here is that I'm taking my x, I'm taking the subset s, and I'm squashing everything inside s down to a single point. That single point is the equivalence class of the elements of s. It leaves the rest of the topological space x completely alone. So for example, we could look at the disk. These are the points whose distance from the origin inside Rn is less than or equal to 1. And I can look inside here at the subset of those things that are of distance exactly 1 from the origin. And if I take my disk and I identify all the points on the sphere, then I get another sphere. That is, if I imagine taking a disk, such as this one, this is the disk all filled in. And I imagine taking the boundary of this disk, inside R2 in this case. Then when I form the quotient, I'm getting the sphere. The equivalence class consisting of all the points around the boundary is, if you like, here at the North Pole. Let's explore another example. This is the example of projective space. Projective space for us comes in two flavors. It comes in the real flavor and the complex flavor. So I'm going to allow k here to stand in for r or c as appropriate. My projective space, pnk, is going to be the set of one-dimensional k-linear subspaces of the vector space k to the n plus 1. We call such a subspace, a one-dimensional k-linear subspace, a line, or k-line, if we want to be emphatic. Any non-zero vector of kn plus 1 will certainly define a k-line, because we can simply form its span. This now defines a surjective map from the set of non-zero vectors inside kn plus 1 to pnk. In other words, pnk is the set of equivalence classes 
of non-zero vectors inside kn plus 1, where I declare that two vectors are similar if and only if there's some scalar alpha in k such that one is the scalar multiple of the other. Well, here I have a perfectly good topological space, and here I have a perfectly good surjective map. So once again, I can look at the final topology on P and K, and that's exactly what I'll do. So we'll equip P and K with this quotient topology, and this is called the n-dimensional projective space. over the field K. The projective line over K is actually something quite familiar. The projective line is the circumstance where N is the number one. Let's see how that works. If I take an element of K, then I can get myself a non-zero vector of K2 by taking the vector 1 comma y. And now I can look at the equivalence class of that under my quotient map and that gives me a line 1 comma y which is an element of the projective line P1k. This accounts for most of the points of the projective line. For example if I take any non-zero vector of k2 and a is non-zero, then the equivalence class of that vector is the same as the equivalence class of 1 comma b over a. Now of course if a is zero I can't get away with that. If a is zero then the equivalence class of this vector is the same as the equivalence class of 0, 1. This process of constructing 1 comma y accounts for all but one of the points of projective space, and there's one more point which is 0, 1. And these are all of the points of projective space. In other words, I can look at projective space, and I can think of it as taking the field K itself, along with an extra point, which we'll call infinity. And this process of assigning to any point of K plus, a point of the projective line, turns out to define a homeomorphism. So I send an element of K to 1 comma Y, as we described up here, and I'll send the point at infinity to the other remaining point of the projective line, 0, 1. This turns out to define a homeomorphism from k plus to the projective line. What does that mean for us? It means that if I look at the projective line over the reals, then I'm just recovering the circle. This, after all, is homeomorphic to R plus, and R plus we've seen is homeomorphic to S1. On the other hand, the projective line over the complexes is homeomorphic to C plus, which is R2 plus, and we've seen that that's homeomorphic to S2. So the projective lines are actually just recovering our old friends the spheres. In higher dimensions, this doesn't happen. The higher dimensional projective spaces are not spheres, but they are understandable in terms of spheres. That is, I could consider, for example, Rn plus 1 minus the origin, and I could consider the n-sphere sitting inside there. This is the space that I took the quotient of to get myself the projective space Pn, and so I can look at the same relation as it exists on Sn. When are two vectors in Sn scalar multiples of each other? Well, that only happens if one is either plus or minus one of the other. So that means I can now define a relation R on the sphere in which two vectors are related if and only if one is the minus of the other. This isn't an equivalence relation, but nevertheless, I'm entitled to take the quotient of this space relative to this relation. And when I do, 
I discover that the n-dimensional projective space is exactly Sn modulo this relation. In other words, I'm taking the n-sphere and I'm identifying antipodal points on the n-sphere. So I'm taking the n-sphere, here I'll draw a picture of the two-sphere, and I'm taking points that are diametrically opposite to one another, say here and here, and I'm identifying them in this equivalence relation. When I do that, I get a space, and that space is my projective space. So although I can't think of projective space as a sphere itself, Pn is not homeomorphic to Sn, Pn is still homeomorphic to a quotient of Sn. This turns out to be really helpful. Let's look at a couple of examples. We can go back to thinking of our projective line, P1 over R. We know that this is secretly just another circle, but I have this quotient map that takes a circle and it identifies the antipodal points on that circle. The fiber of this map over a line spanned by one of the vectors inside S1 just consists of the two vectors minus x and x. So when we think about this map, the way we should think about this map is as a way of arranging S1 according to P1. That is, down here we have our copy of P1, and we think of putting the fibers over each point directly over it. When we do that, we see that we have to take our S1 and knot it up a little bit. But when we do that, we see exactly how this map operates. The fiber over any point is a pair of points, and these are antipodal points on the circle. So that's the situation when n equals 1 for the real projective line. If we think of the 2n plus 1 sphere sitting inside cn plus 1, then we can define an equivalence relation, Q, on that sphere by the following rule. We'll say that x is related to y via Q if and only if, for some scalar lying in S1, here we're thinking of S1 as a subset of the complex numbers, x is alpha times y. With that equivalence relation, we can define the quotient space of S2n plus 1 under this equivalence relation. And just as we saw before, we arrive at a homeomorphism between the quotient space and our friend the projective space. Now this is the projective space over the complex numbers. So we can try to contemplate this when n is equal to 1. That will say that the projective line is some quotient of S3. Remember that the projective line over the complex numbers is homeomorphic to S2. So what we're saying is that S2 is some interesting quotient of S3. Let's see that in action now. The quotient map from S3 to P1 over the complex numbers, which is another name for C+, which is another name for S2, this quotient map is called the Hopf map. It's one of the most important maps in topology. So let's spend a moment to contemplate it for a little while. Let's think of what it does. It carries a point of S3. This is a pair of complex numbers Z and W, such that the absolute value of Z squared plus the absolute value of W squared equals 1. And it carries it to the complex line ZW. This is the span of this vector inside C2. So this defines a point of P1. But P1 is homeomorphic to C+. So what does this correspond to, this point Z, W? Well, there are two options. Either Z is 0 or it isn't. If it isn't, then that corresponds to w over z, which is a complex number, 
And if z is zero, then it corresponds to infinity. Okay, but we just said that c plus is itself another name for s2. And so that means that we can think of this point as a point of s2. It's easy to write down a formula for that point. Here it is. If I think of s2 as a subset of c cross r, normally I would think of it as a subset of r3, but it's quite handy to think of it this way, then the point zw under the Hopf map is going to 2 times w times the complex conjugate of z. That's the complex number in the first coordinate. And the real number in the second coordinate is the absolute value of w squared minus the absolute value of z squared. This formula, notice, makes perfect sense even when z is zero. So we don't have to divide up in cases as we did when we were thinking of this as a point of c plus. This map eta is extremely remarkable because what it's going to show us is it's going to show us that the three sphere can be parametrized over the two sphere using one spheres, i.e. circles. Another way to say that is that it's showing you how to take the three sphere and fiber it over the two sphere where each of the fibers looks like a circle. So what am I saying here? I'm saying that if you look at the inverse image under eta of any point of my S2, then I'll see something that is homeomorphic to a circle. Let's see that explicitly in the case where z comma w is 0 comma 1. Well, the inverse image of 0 comma 1 under eta consists of all the points 0 comma w, where w is a complex number of modulus 1. In the same vein, I can take the opposite pole of S2 and look at the inverse image of 0 minus 1, and that consists of the points z0 in C2, where z is an element of S1. The story that we're seeing here with these specific fibers is one that's repeated throughout the sphere. All of the fibers are the same for this particular map. Notice that this is just a copy of the circle sitting inside C2, and this is another copy of the circle sitting inside C2. Those two circles are linked inside C2. More generally, for any point of the three sphere, I can look at its image inside the two sphere, and I can look at its inverse image back inside the three sphere. And well, what is that? Well, those are all the scalar multiples of the point that I started with, z comma w, where the scaling factor has to lie in S1. This is a subset of S3, and that subset is homeomorphic to the circle. To get a better idea of how the Hopf map works, and to start constructing in our minds a picture of it, Let's consider the inverse image of the equator. The equator is the center line in S2, and we can look at its inverse image under eta. We've already seen the inverse image of every point is a circle, and now I want to think about the inverse image of something a little bigger, like the equator. Well, recall that we have this homeomorphism between S2 and P1. So when I think about the equator in S2, what does it correspond to in P1? It corresponds to the set of lines z comma w such that the modulus of w and the modulus of z are equal. So now if I look at the inverse image of that collection under the Hopf map, then I'll find the collection of z and w's such that the modulus of w equals the modulus of z or equivalently, the set of points of R4, remember this, these are points inside C2 here, so I can look at the point, these points as points of R4, call them Z0, Z1, W0, W1, this is the real and imaginary part of Z, and this is the real and imaginary part of W, such that 
the sum of the squares of the z's is equal to the sum of the squares of the w's, and each of these has to be equal to one half, because after all, the sum of all four of them has to be equal to one in order to be a point in S3. So we're looking at the set of points inside R4, such that the sum of the squares of the first two components is one half, and the sum of the square of the second two components is one half. That's exactly the equation for a torus. This is a copy of S1 cross S1. That's a torus. To see that more explicitly, if you take this equation and you use the homeomorphism between S3 and R3+, plus, then you discover that this equation corresponds to the equation the square root of r squared plus s squared minus the square root of 2 quantity squared plus t squared equals 1 sitting inside r3. This is exactly the equation that we've studied for a torus that lives inside r3. So this is very exciting indeed. This is telling us that our Hopf map, which is carrying us from the 3 sphere down to the 2 sphere, when I look at the inverse image of the equator, I'm getting a torus sitting inside my S3. When I think of S3 as R3+, plus, that torus actually lives inside R3 itself. So now when I contemplate this, I can think of the Hopf map as carrying S3 to S2, and the inverse image of the equator is a torus. And so I could, for example, think about the inverse image now, not just of the equator, but of the entire northern hemisphere. That would give me a solid torus. And on the other hand, I could look at the inverse image of the southern hemisphere, and that would give me another solid torus that was complementary to the first solid torus. In other words, we've seen that there's a very graceful way to see that the three-sphere is a union of two solid tori along their boundary torus. The Hopf map has many, many joys, and I encourage you to reflect for a little while on what, for example, the inverse image of two antipodal points on S2 under the Hopf map should be. What do they look like? In the description below, I'll include a link to a wonderful video showing you the dynamics of the Hopf map and showing the fibers as points move around in S2 as they live inside S3. But now let's move on to a new example. Suppose that I have a group G and a topological space X. And let's assume I have an action that I'm willing to call alpha of my group G on my X via continuous maps. What does that mean? That means that for every element of my group, alpha g, which remember is a map from x to itself, we're going to demand that that is continuous. Well, since it's continuous, and since this is a group action, I also have alpha of g inverse, which is a map going from x to x in the other direction, and that has to be the inverse of this map. That means that not only is this map continuous, but in fact it's a homeomorphism. When we have this circumstance, we can define an equivalence relation, tilde, on x in the following way. I'll say that two points, x and y of x, are related under this equivalence relation if and only if there's an element g of g such that x is alpha of g applied to y. Well, what do I have? I have a topological space and I have an equivalence relation, so it must be time to form the quotient. So let's do that. The set of equivalence classes, x mod sim, will be lazily written as either x mod g, or if we want to be clearer about what the action is, x mod alpha. The fibers of the quotient map from x to x mod g are precisely the orbits of the action. Those orbits are then equipped with the subspace topology coming from x.
So this now says that if we have a topological space with a group action, where the group is acting via continuous maps, then I can form the quotient under that group action and get a new topological space called x mod g. This is giving us access to an entire world of new topological spaces for us to explore. A first good example is to look at Rn, our old friend Euclidean space, and let's let z to the n act on it. How will we do that? Well, if I have a n-tuple of integers, and I have an n-tuple of real numbers, then the action will just give me m1 plus x1 up to mn plus xn. What does the quotient look like, rn mod zn? Well, to check this, you should first think of the example where n is equal to 1, and you're simply talking about r mod z. In that circumstance, you're identifying any two real numbers whose distance apart is an integer. If you reflect on what that means, you'll see that this quotient is homeomorphic to S1. And then it's not too much of a stretch to believe that if you take Rn mod Zn, then you arrive at S1 to the n, aka the n-dimensional torus Tn. We can also look at the cyclic group of order 2, which I like to call C2, that acts on Sn. We've actually already seen this example. The action is going to take 0 to the identity and 1 to minus the identity. If I look at the quotient space, then I'm taking Sn and I'm identifying the antipodal points on Sn. We've seen a name for this already, which is real projective space Pn. An example of a slightly different behavior is the following. I can consider a topological space x and any positive integer, and I can look at the symmetric group on n letters, and that acts on x to the n. A typical point of x to the n looks like x1 through xn, and the action is just going to permute the indices of the points. So once again, we have a perfectly good action of a group on a topological space, you can check that this is via continuous maps, and so we can ask, what is the quotient? And in general, it's quite hard to write down this quotient, but let's look at a very particular example, namely x is s1. So we're going to have x be s1, and we're going to look at s1 cross s1 modulo sigma 2. How can we think of the points of this topological space? Well, a point represents a pair of points, but I don't know in what order I've given that pair of points. In other words, a point of this space is really an unordered pair of points on the circle. So how can we study such a space? An important principle for us is that a great way to study a topological space that's a little mysterious is to try to identify an interesting map into it or out of it. In this case, we're going to write down an interesting map out of it using the universal property of quotients. So first I'm going to write down a map from S1 cross S1 to S1, and for that I'm going to use my knowledge that S1 lies inside the complex plane, and that if I take the product of two complex numbers of modulus 1, I get a new number of modulus 1. Now multiplication is commutative. Z times W is the same thing as W times Z, so this continuous map factors through the quotient. Here I have the quotient, S1 cross S1 mod sigma 2, and I'm mapping down to S1. So let's try to imagine what the fibers of this map must look like. Let's start off with the point 1 inside S1. All of the fibers will look similar in this example, so let's just think of a particular case of the number 1. Well, if I think about the fiber under my original map here, then I'm looking at all those pairs Z and W that go to the number 1. In other words, I'm looking at pairs consisting of a complex number of modulus 1 and its inverse. So the inverse image under the map M is the set of pairs of complex numbers of modulus 1 whose product is the number 1. This is the set of complex numbers of modulus 1 along with their inverses.
But this, of course, is completely determined by z. As soon as you know what z is, w is completely determined. Therefore, m inverse of 1, the fiber over the number 1, is the circle. And it's the circle given to you by z, say. OK, that's the fiber of the original map m. But we were trying to understand the fiber of the map f that we constructed using m. Well, whatever that is, it should be the inverse image under m quotiented out by this group action. What does this group action do? Remember, it permutes the two coordinates. It carries zw to wz. Now, if I think of a point m inverse of 1 as specified just by the first coordinate z, then this sigma 2 action is carrying z to 1 over z. And since z is a complex number of modulus 1, 1 over z is also the complex conjugate of z. What does that look like geometrically? Well, I'm taking my circle, and I'm looking at points and their complex conjugates, and I'm identifying them. So I'm taking all the points and their complex conjugates, and I'm identifying them under the equivalence relation here. When I do that, what happens? Well, all of these points are then identified with all of these points, and so you're just left with a single interval. That interval is a closed interval from minus 1 to plus 1. When we think about the inverse image of the number 1, we see that we have these two special elements of the inverse image that are the two square roots of the number 1. The same thing happens for all the fibers. The inverse image of z is a closed interval, and the endpoints are exactly the square roots of our z. Good, so we're starting to develop a pretty good looking picture here of what this quotient space looks like. We have the fact that we've got a beautiful map from this quotient space down to S1. But there's more. Inside this quotient space is the diagonal copy of S1. That is to say the pairs z comma w where w and z are actually equal. In other words, it's the subspace consisting of the unordered pairs where the two elements in the pair happen to be the same thing. So what happens when we restrict our map, which is a map from S1 cross S1 mod sigma 2 down to the circle? What happens when we restrict that map to the diagonal S1? Well, it exactly carries beta in S1 to the square of beta. Remember, the fiber of this thing is a closed interval whose endpoints are the two square roots. This S1 consists of exactly those endpoints and nothing more. So how does this look? It looks like this. Here's our quotient space, S1 cross S1 mod sigma 2. And here's our circle. The fiber of our map F over any point of our circle is a closed interval, and the endpoints of that closed interval are the two square roots of my z. Now as z travels around here, we can't make a consistent choice of which square root is the positive one and which one is the negative one. Indeed, as you go around this circle, if you follow a certain choice of square root, you'll discover that when you've made a complete loop, that you've arrived at the other choice. This quotient space here has a name. It's called the Mobius band. The Mobius band consists of the set of unordered pairs of complex numbers of modulus 1. It has a map, which is given to you by multiplying those two complex numbers together, down to S1 itself. The fibers of that map are closed intervals. The endpoints of those fibers are the two square roots of the complex number you started with.